Well, good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I appreciate uh, those of you who made the trek across the uh, parking lot. Some of them may have been blown into the bay out there, or blown off uh, the Oso, so I hope not. Hopefully you made it. But uh, uh, welcome to the Texas A&M Corpus Christi campus and the Heart Research Institute. Uh, I'm Dr. Larry McKinney. I'm the director of the Institute, and I'm going to uh, uh, moderate uh, today. Um, just from housekeeping, uh, first of all, in case we need to get out of here, obviously you can see we have emergency exits here in the, in the restroom facilities or by the main door down that long corridor, so there's restrooms there. Uh, to get started, uh, before we put the fan in, if you could turn your phones down to vibrate, that would be good. I'd remember to turn mine down too before that happens, so that would be helpful. Um, we have uh, some presentations to start with uh, to kind of set the stage, and then we'll ask the panel to come up. And our first um, presenter is uh, Brett Clayton. So, Brett, if you're uh, ready, I think I'll just turn this over to you. All right. All right, thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, my name is Brent Clayton. I'm the water resource planner for the city, Corpus Christi. And what I'm going to talk about is a quick 10-minute overview of uh, what our watershed in the Nueces River Basin, uh, what our current lake levels are, and some of our uh, short-term projections for our lake levels. <clears throat> All right, so here's our Nueces uh, watershed. It's about 16,000 square miles. It's a pretty significant uh, area stretching from Corpus Christi in the, in the east all the way up to Edwards County in the west. Um, you can see the, the blue shaded area up on the map is the area that drains into Choke Canyon Reservoir. And the, and the yellow area drains into Lake Corpus Christi. These are our two um, water supply reservoirs in the, in the basin. Choke Canyon's uh, quite, quite bigger than Lake Corpus Christi, as you can see it's about, uh, it's close to 700,000 acre feet, and Lake Corpus Christi is over 200,000. Um, we also get water from the west through the Mary Roads pipeline, and that comes from Lake Texana in Jackson County. And that's a 100-mile pipeline uh, that delivers water from uh, Lake Texana every day. And in this dashed line is our proposed phase two of the Mary Roads pipeline, which would uh, bring water in from the Colorado River. Just a little overview. Um, it's 100% surface water, uh, all surface water, no groundwater. It's nearly 500,000 residents that are served. Okay, so we're not just the city of Corpus Christi um, residents that, that, are, that receive our water. We deliver water to wholesale customers um, south of Corpus Christi into Kingsville and also over towards Rockport. So we have a, a broad a range of, of customers that, that we sell our water to. Um, just to give you some idea of the amount of water that we use in 2011, our whole regional system uses 126,000 acre feet. And one acre foot of water is 325,000 gallons. So that's about 41.1 uh, billion gallons of water. It's a tremendous amount. Um, if we look at just the city itself, we treated and used uh, 78,000 acre feet, or about 25.5 billion gallons. All right, so what are our lake levels now? Uh, last month, I went up to the Lake Corpus Christi and took some, some pictures, and this was one of the shots I took from uh, a residential neighborhood uh, that used to have um, some type of water canal right there, but as you can see, uh, the lake is off in the distance. Another picture I took um, a little farther, farther north up into the lake, um, you can't even see any water at this point. So obviously there's docks and boats just sitting on the dry, the dry lake bed. So what's it translate to? Uh, from a water planning perspective, we look at the combined capacity of Lake Corpus Christi and Choke Canyon reservoirs. Uh, we add up all the total volume and whatever that is over the, the full combined volume, that's the percentage uh, that the lake levels are. So this is the past two years. Let me use my pointer here. Uh, we started in, in the early 2011, just over 80%. And today we're about 36.7, 36 36.6 um, 36 in, that, in that range. So as you can see, we've dropped over 40% in the, in the past two years. <clears throat> and one thing I want to 
uh, emphasize is that this is a very common occurrence in South Texas. Uh, where if you look at the western portion of our watershed, it's a very semi-arid uh, semi region. Um, the western part of our watershed may receive 18, 20 inches in a good year. Uh, we average 32 inches of rainfall uh, per year. So um, we have droughts and wet years, they come and go. So this is the past 13 years, as you can see, the last drought that we had that, that was this bad was in 2001. Our combined lake levels got down to about 31%. So we're pretty close to what the lake levels were uh, back in 2001. Um, and what I did was I created this to show the importance of our water planning and the, the importance of Mary Road's pipeline. I, I looked at a hypothetical situation to see what the lake levels would look like if we did not have Mary Road's pipeline. And right now, this red line would show you where we would have been right now had we had not had uh, Mary Road's water, Mary Road's pipeline from Lake Texana. So every time that the lakes fill up, we zero out. So um, the lakes would fill. But because we're not getting that supplemental water, uh, the draw on the lakes would be, would be greater. So as you can see, if we didn't have Lake Texana water, we'd be below 20% right now. So it gives us a good 15 to 20% buffer at this moment. <clears throat> uh, some of, we have a, a Corpus Christi model that we use to project water supply into the future. And this looks at historical, uh, historical river flow data. And this is a short-term projection at our combined lake levels. And if weather patterns don't change, so this is an absolute minimum. We, they, the model gives us three different lines, a minimum, an average, and a maximum. And this is the minimum line. And you can see if we continue the same weather patterns, we're going to hit the 30% lake levels by June, July, and 20% later this year. And that's all I have for an overview of the, of the watershed and the lake levels. Uh, I'll take any quick questions from the audience if you have them. If not, we'll move into to John Metz and he'll talk about the, the weather aspect. While well, you're answering questions, I'm just gonna load up this other one. Okay. So go ahead, please. Does anyone have any questions or, or comments? <coughs> Too much good news at one time, huh? I don't know if it's gonna improve. Okay. How much uh, well water is used in the service of the lake? Uh, there's, there's no wells that's, that that we use for the city. So there's, I mean, there's residents around the lake that have water wells for their private residents, but we don't have any water wells for the city itself. That last slide you showed was, uh, I guess, the city called this case scenario. Are, do you have any of the numbers that uh, the Medicaid has here, or did, did you have interest in this you could share with us? Do I have any? Excuse me. Right. Right. Yeah. And if if the the average is the lake levels would gradually increase in the next few months, so it depends on average uh, precipitation and and stream water or stream flows. Any any other questions? Yes. Yes, yeah, so there's a, a tremendous amount of water that does evaporate from the lakes, uh, but with a surface water body, uh, at this moment there's not that kind of technology, fee or at a reasonable cost technology that we could use to prevent that evaporation from occurring. What about if you stored the water differently and used perhaps aquifers, uh, underground aquifers, where you would have no, no, I understand that the city has sort of a, Right, so the question is about aquifer storage instead of lake, lake storage to reduce evaporation. And we have an aquifer storage and recovery district uh, in Corpus Christi, 
and that's one of our uh, priorities right now is, is um, doing a study to locate a, a good spot to do some type of aquifer storage project. Um, San Antonio, for example, they store about 90,000 uh, 90, acre feet, and you know none of that is, is subject to evaporation, so it's definitely a, a, a good option, and we're, we're looking into it. So. All right, thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Tell us what's coming to the future, Doc. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in talking about the future, um, first, let's look at the past. This is the rainfall data collected officially in Corpus Christi by the National Weather Service dating back to 1887. So you can see kind of the annual trend. We don't really get normal rainfall here in, in the Corpus area, and you really don't anywhere. The weather is extremely variable, and so over time, the last 30 years, if you average our rainfall amount, we should get 31 inches of rain a year. But you can see it doesn't usually happen that way, and so you can see the extreme variability. We've been through some episodes of dry weather before. Uh, long duration droughts. Uh, if you go back, uh, 1917 was actually the driest year on record for Corpus Christi, where we only had about five inches of rain that year. 2011 is certainly the second driest. It's number one driest year on record for the state of Texas, but the second driest for Corpus Christi at just over 10 inches. But the 30s, the 1930s and the 1950s, had more of a long duration drought, maybe not as intense as we saw in 2011, but that long duration of five to seven to even 10 years uh, can also have significant impacts on your water resources. In the last you know, 10 to 20 years, you can see we've had some pretty wet years. We've had episodes where we've pushed close to 50 inches of rain. And, and so there's been a lot of variability and you haven't seen more than three years really of a extremely dry episode. But based on the last two years in that graph, uh, we are facing a serious drought situation. In fact, D4 is the as dry as you can get on the map. They may have to create a new category. Um, but right now, you know, we're missing about three feet of rainfall over the last two years. And so that correlates into an exceptional drought in this area. Areas just to the north, you can see there's quite a, a gradient. If you go up to Victoria, uh, over to where Lake Texana is, they've had more rain. They've been in a more favorable uh, location where the rain and storms have gone through that area in, a, in the last six <coughs> to nine months or so, and so their water resources are a lot higher there. And so it only takes, you know, a really good storm to sit over you for a month, and it ch com can completely change your environment. Predicting that, though, is, is, is the real challenge. So if you look month by month, when is the normal rainfall uh, expected, well, the wettest periods are spring, so you get May and June, so late spring, early summer, and then later in the summer associated with tropical cyclones that move into the area. So we just went through the driest part of the year, the winter and early spring, and so we should see a return to a little bit more rainfall, uh, but what's the real forecast? Well, looking ahead, you know, our specialty at the Weather Service here in Corpus Christi, we really only forecast out seven days. And the next seven days doesn't look good. There's a big hole right over Texas, unfortunately. If you go out two weeks into the future, you're stretching it. The computer models really don't have a whole lot of skill beyond seven days. But if you run them a whole bunch of times and change the variables, the overall prediction is for below normal rainfall here in South Texas, unfortunately. If you go out a month to three months into the future, now a little more challenging. Uh, but based on the state of El Nino or La Nina that's out in the Pacific, and I'll talk about that in a minute, the Climate Prediction Center can do longer range predictions. And so in looking at March, April, and May, still looking at below normal <laughs> rainfall, a pretty good confidence in that 33 to 40 percent confidence of below normal rainfall here in the coastal bend. And essentially the same holds true into the summertime. And so as you get into the summer, you're really at the mercy of, of tropical storms and hurricanes, and you never know where they're going to go. And so there's no predictability, there's no science that can tell us yet where those are going to go and whether we're going to get a storm or not this summer, uh, which could totally change the environment. In fact, many times tropical storms and hurricanes have really given us a lot of rainfall that we've needed. The official drought outlook by NOAA that goes through the end of May uh, shows just 
the drought persisting or intensifying here in South Texas. And that is, it's not good news, especially for this growing season for agriculture uh, and for our community. Some of the variables though, in this long range prediction, uh, the state of El Nino or La Nina. This is a phenomena out in the Pacific Ocean, the central tropical Pacific. When the water temperatures out there misbehave, when the water gets warmer than normal, we call that El Nino. El Nino is generally good for South Texas. It changes the jet stream, it changes the weather pattern. We generally see above normal rainfall here when El Nino forms. La Nina, essentially the opposite. The ocean cools, it gets colder than normal. It changes the jet stream, shifting it well to the north, and that's what we've seen here for the last couple of years. La Nina has really kind of put the nail in the coffin, so to speak, as far as the weather pattern shifting the rains well away from this region. This map is showing the forecast. This graphic shows all the different countries of the world's models and trying to predict the state of El Nino or La Nina through the end of the year. The very mm -hmm. last one is October, November, December of this year. And so they're all essentially coloring the yellow on the graph, which is neutral, neither El Nino or La Nina. Neutral, you can kind of correlate that with you know, near normal weather patterns, near normal rainfall. The probabilities of us staying neutral through the end of the year are somewhere 50% or greater. That's a pretty good, pretty good probability. And El Nino, La Nina probability is developing by the end of the year somewhere around 25% or less. That's the way it stands right now. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Scott. John, you mentioned last century we had four La Ninas in a row. Is that correct? Last century? In the last century? Well, going back to the very first slide, you know, you can see uh, we've had many more La Ninas. Uh, there have been a great number of La Ninas. In fact, I think going back to 1950, there have been n about 20 El Ninos, 20 neutral situations, and 20 La Ninas. And so, you know, about a third of the time, you're going to be in one of those situations. And so generally, a third of the time, you're going to be in a, in a dry weather pattern. Is this the second year in a row for La Nina? Yes. Right now, it is neutral. We did go through two years in a row of La Nina. Right now, we're neutral. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> well, El Nino was first, uh, it started off back in the, I believe, 1700s, uh, a Portuguese sailor traveling around the world was there in, in the South American coast and noticed the change in water, the water temperatures, that the water was warmer than normal, it changed the fishing patterns. It was around Christmas time, so they named it El Nino because around, it was referencing the Christ child. History lesson too, so you Your chance to stump the meteorologist. <laughs> I thought that might get him, but he did good on that. So well done. Thank you. Alrighty, so thanks everyone. Okay. Let's see, get this one right. I think and next up, I think Ray, I believe you're up next. Let me get you to talk about the upper end of the systems here. Forward and backward. I got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ray Allen with the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program. I did not prepare a weather forecast because you know how much they're valued around here. Um, I really have, uh, I'm going to st step you through just a few slides here and talk about conditions in Nueces Bay. And first, I want to acknowledge uh, Leo Trevino from our staff who is here today. Hey, Leo, thanks. And uh, Jace Tunnel, who actually puts the slides together, but he's, he's somewhere working. So uh, uh, you all seen this picture before, it's Corpus Christi Bay and Nueces Bay. The blue line represents uh, the Nueces River and the highlighted area there is the Nueces River Delta. Uh, important, critical, sensitive habitat in there when the floods come, which seems like less and less often. Um, you know, that, those habitats are really important out there. That should get you oriented. 
And normally you would have a, a salinity gradient uh, coming from the river uh, going to the ocean of you know, obviously uh, zero or near zero in the river and working its way out to the Gulf of Mexico at 34 parts per thousand uh, salinity conditions. And that would be your classic salinity gradient in an estuary environment. Uh, what we're actually seeing uh, under these drought conditions is that one. So it's actually uh, lower salinities in the Gulf of Mexico and as you work your way back up into the Nueces Delta, not all the way up into the river obviously, but up into the Delta, you see uh, hypersalinity conditions, you see uh, uh, salinity levels up in the flats and in the back part of the Nueces River Delta up in the 70s. It's a function of evaporation and a lack of input of fresh water. Uh, but we're starting to see now uh, salinity levels in uh, Nueces Bay. And uh, if you could follow the red line here, uh, the, the, the red line is up in the delta at what we call uh, state, Nueces Delta Station Number 2. And where's John Adams? He got a kick out of calling it Nude 2. Uh, so, um, but you can see salinities are highly variable as a function of uh, either uh, river flows or pumping events or rainfall events in that area. Uh, but you can see we had a, even through uh, 2012, we had a nice long period of salinity conditions, you know, in the uh, 10 to 20 to, to 30 range. But uh, now without rainfall events and without inputs of freshwater inflows, and in we're now seeing salinities up in the uh, 50, 60 part per thousand range. That's extremely hypersaline, extremely tough on the environment. Uh, let's turn for a minute to the uh, green line, which is a station in Nueces Bay. It's a, it's a monitoring station, SALT-3. It's the official station that's used for freshwater inflow management purposes under the agreed order. A and you can see here, even going through 2012, even though it was a, a, a pretty dry year, you know, salinities in Nueces Bay were around 30. Now in these back bays, like Nueces Bay, that's a little high but not unusual during a drought condition. But now with uh, really the lack of rainfall and uh, at the end of last summer in 2012, that September line there, you can see the green line popped up. And we're now seeing salinities in the bay at about 40 parts per thousand to 45 parts per thousand, depending on which way the wind's blowing and circulation out there. Really, uh, we've reached those hypersaline conditions in these back bays. Uh, and that, that affects, and I'm not going to go into all the biology here, but obviously that affects all kinds of living animals and, and plants and things going on. The biological processes going on in those bays becomes quite stressful and changes the whole biological productivity of the system. And, and uh, Larry, that's really all the slides I had. I just want to stop here and let people see what salinity conditions are doing out here. And, We'll talk some more during the panel. We're going to talk extensively about that. So. Exactly. Uh, I appreciate that, Ray. So if our, and what we're going to do, we have a, a, a panel. If our panelists would come on up here and, and uh, take their seats, we will, uh, we will get started on that while I uh, take care of this. <coughs> and I can just put this one up there just to have it background. It's not a bad thing to have there. We'll get four in it. That's not bad. And I'm just going. I'm going to uh, ask our panelists just to introduce themselves and say, and, and uh, with whom they are associated. And we'll start with David. So please. Um, I'm David Sykes. I'm the outdoors columnist for the Caller Times. Have been since '98, I believe. Uh, I cover mostly fishing and hunting and conservation issues, the legislative issues that deal with all of the things that I write about. My name is John Metz, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. I've been here forecasting in South Texas. This is 20, 20, my 21st year. Uh, I'm Ray Allen with the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program. No, just, just leave it sitting down there. It, it works. Just leave it down there? Just leave that, it'll, it'll pick up, I think. I think. I like, I like to hold it. <laughs> I know you. It's your problem. Your papers. <laughs> yeah. You can if you want to, Ray. I'm not going to deny you holding your microphone. Very good. I know you're sort of a game show host kind of guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> Please, uh, and. Okay, uh, and I'm Rocky Friend. I'm with the Nueces River Authority, the Deputy Executive Director um, in the Corpus Christi office. I've been with NRA for 
uh, about 14 years, but it worked uh, with the Blucher Institute before that and worked on the salinity monitoring project and have been in, in track a lot of the, the data that we uh, look at for operating the reservoirs and such in the salinity data. I'm Con Mims. I'm executive director of Noasis River Authority out of our main office in Uvalde. <laughs> and uh, I've been with the River Authority since 76, about the time Choke Canyon was underway. And thank you all. I appreciate your participating. So we have a very knowledgeable panel here uh, with us today to, uh, to help answer some questions. And here's how I think I'm going to proceed. I do have some questions uh, to get this thing started and, and to cover a few areas. But as we go along, if, if you have a question or as, if we hear an answer or something that doesn't make sense or is not clear to you, you know, let, let me know. Raise your hand or whatever. Or if you have a question yourself as we go into these various topics, we're going to go by topics more or less. Uh, don't hesitate to... Uh, get my attention and, and let us uh, and bring that question forward so you can, you can try to get an answer because you, uh, you have a, a group here that can if, if they can't answer it probably no one no one can so I appreciate that the first uh, set of topics or questions to talk about and for a panel this is whomever feels brave enough or wants to, to answer them uh, and I will pick somebody out if you stay quiet too long I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pick you out to make you uh, get you on the table but these are about environmental impacts and the first question was uh, how will the drought impact the environment in the lakes and, and the Oasis River? We did see one picture. It's a pretty severe one, but any, any, uh, anything beyond the, those, very, uh, those pictures that really are pretty self-evident? Other issues? What, what have we seen? Well, well, I've seen some. I know the, 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 the white bass run in, um, in the Oasis, I mean, in, in the Lake Corpus Christi area is virtually nil this year. Um, they, they have no access to the river, and as you probably know, they go upstream. And, um, I'm in touch with John Van Dyson, who's the inland fisheries guy out there in Mathis, and uh, he keeps me posted on what's going on. You know, some of those fish will spawn anyway at the mouth of the river or nearby, and I understand a few of them manage to get through just like salmon do, uh, but uh, it's going to be uh, certainly a, a thwarted uh, spawn this year. It's typical that's happened before, so it's, the, the fish is not in jeopardy or anything. It's just going to be a, a, a poor year class. And we're talking talk about impacts on the river and, and the lake. We'll move to the bay in a moment, but certainly from, from Rocky and, and Con, you're into things that uh, you're up, up in that end all the time. Uh, yeah, from a water quality standpoint, with the uh, amount of evaporation in the uh, lakes going down, the uh, concentration of TDS chloride and sulfates are rising, which can cause problems for the city for um, treatment of the water to make it drinking water quality. In the very upper end of the Noasis Basin, we have uh, rivers that are flat dry now, which is not unusual, even in normal conditions <laughs> during the summer. But Leona River has been dry for about three years. Uh, the Noasis River is very, very sluggish uh, where it flows at all. And uh, I don't know, this, I, I, maybe somebody can answer later on uh, if this is really a bad thing or if it's just a normal dry cycle that we have had uh, apparently a third of the time Mr. Metz, for the, over the last century, it, I, I'm not so sure that uh, that the uh, plants and animals and and, and uh, environment that we have here in South Texas aren't a result of stressful conditions like this. And I don't know that we need to, uh, other than running out of drinking water, I don't know that we need to be extremely concerned about it. I, I would say on the on the Nueces and the other rivers in the basin. You know, they really have shrunk down to a series of small pools, and even some of them have dried up. Oh, yeah. and, and so what happens is it will, there'll be fish out there and there'll be other organisms that are surviving in these pools. But it takes a long time after the water comes back for those populations to get reestablished throughout the entire range. And I'm not sure how long, it depends on which species you're talking about. Uh, it's quite severe. Um, but you know, as Con mentioned, as others have, these are natural conditions. These are natural droughts. Um, you know, these, these are tough times out there, not just on the fish and the clams and the things in the river, but the other animals that depend on the river that come to the river. And, uh, so these, these are tough times, and, and you would expect wildlife populations to be decreasing significantly as a result of these dry times. And <laughs> the same, in the, same in the lakes. Uh, you talk about the white bass and the other fish species. You know, you, as the lake gets smaller, you get fewer fish and fewer other wildlife associated with the lake. And they will come back once the lake is filled up, whether, whether Parks and Wildlife does a stocking program or 
the survivors are given a chance to repopulate, they, they will come back, but it won't be overnight. And if you lose the bass population, it's gonna take a long time for it to come yeah. back to, to harvestable size. Mm -hmm. At least at this point, Parks and Wildlife says that the, uh, the, uh, the largemouth bass population is fairly healthy. Of course, they're very concentrated and they're getting very little pressure because there's not a single boat ramp on the lake that's uh, operable. Don, did you have any uh, response to Con until about just kind of basically long term? Yeah, we are in what the Wild Hearts Desert, but uh, a couple of comments. Just one thing we've typically seen when when we're in a long duration drought like this, and then you do start to get rainfall. It takes a while for you know just surface conditions and the vegetation to kind of recover from actually getting rain. And a lot of the first rains that you see evaporate into the cracks. The water doesn't end up in the river. It, you know, we we've seen that this year. We've seen some two and three and four inch rain events up in the watershed and then we look at the river gauges and where to go it's not showing up uh, in the lakes uh, like we would have hoped it would have uh, just because there's big cracks out there and everything's dry and then there's a lot of evaporation uh, one thing we do know is though you know as i mentioned earlier is that in the tropical season a storm could most certainly change things in a hurry and we've seen past hurricanes you know, an example of 1954 uh, hurricane Alice that moved up the Rio Grande and produced a tremendous amount of water and it filled up Falcon Dam as soon as they opened it. It was just constructed, filled that reservoir up instantly. And so you can you can get a tropical storm in a hurricane that moves very slowly, gives you a tremendous amount of rain, and you can get an immediate recovery. Uh, whether we're going to get one though, you know, is, is beyond forecast capabilities at this time. Sure, John, not as a, a, essentially asking for a hurricane to come through here, but <laughs> we just like to have the rain and not everything else is the, the, the point. Just kind of jump over us and just rain is what you like, to, which, which is the point. Uh, okay, let's move. Any, any questions about lakes or rivers? Or, uh, you know, just, I'm going to, uh, if not, I'm just going to move on down. Let's talk about uh, uh, Nueces Bay and, and Corpus Christi Bay. And you shall raise a uh, uh, hypersailing um, deal there, which is interesting, and, and this is something we, you, have to, you have to switch minds. I, used to, I worked on water for many years, and of course in the upper coast area, you think about rivers uh, feeding into estuaries, and that's where you get your freshwater inflow, but during these times, and even nor normal times in the Laguna, it's really the opposite. The freshwater comes in from the sea, and unfortunately, that's what we're beginning to see here in Corpus Christi, but the fresher water is coming in from the sea now to this point, that type of thing. So uh, any comments or a question of anyone on like what we're seeing in the Oasis Bay and, and Corpus Christi Bay and, and those types of things by now? Well, anyway? I, I think what we've seen before, what the, the biological data, especially from Texas Parks and Wildlife and their, their really good monitoring program they have, is that as these high, salinity levels uh, increase, you know, you're not gonna see fish killed overnight. I don't wanna give anybody that impression. But you start seeing effects at the at the lower end of the food chain. You start seeing uh, maybe the shrimp aren't doing quite as well. Maybe the uh, maybe the little minnows and the and the little uh, shad, some of the lower food web items, just they just aren't producing in the kind of numbers that then drive the overall biology of the system. Uh, different species, you know, the reason um, a black drum are so plentiful down in the Baffin Bay system is that they're able to outcompete other organisms that, that in that high salinity condition, although it can get too salty for black drum even. And we may be seeing some of that now. Um, but these things work their way up the food web, and this, this is important. There's, besides all the sport fish that we all like to catch and take home and eat, David, uh, release. You know, all of, <laughs> Uh, all that food web leads up to other <coughs> organisms uh, that we all appreciate. There's a number of nesting islands in the bay for a variety of uh, bird species. Um, you know, they, they need uh, the kind of bait fish that they can catch and feed to their young. And if you don't have a good year with that, you can have a poor production from the nest. You know, these are all things that come into play. There's a lot of other variables, storms and high tides and low tides, uh, but you know, the effects on, on uh, nutrient inputs to the system because of lack of river flow, the effects of salinity conditions in the bay, and what that does to the overall complex food web is, can be very significant. The system doesn't die, it just starts changing. And then when it does rain again, it'll have to change back. So much like in the lake, you have a recovery period 
for the shrimp and the blue crab and the Atlantic croaker and other species to move back in. And of course, we've already lost really harvestable quantities of uh, 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 oysters from that bay system. It's just too salty too often to really sustain an oyster fishery out there. And that's a direct result of uh, reduced inflows and other impacts too, to be sure. But, but that's the main one. David, what are you seeing from hearing from your folks that uh, well, talk Ray to you? Well, Ray makes a good point, uh, and I, I'm going to I'm going to hit hit it even harder. Some of the, uh, the 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 food web issues that are impacted by the conditions down there are so subtle that we don't see them, and, and that's dangerous. It's dangerous because a lot of people, the public perception is that as long as I'm catching my trout down there, what's the problem? Well, I've explained it before in print and verbally, you have no idea what a bay system looks like when it's on the brink of cratering. But too many people seem to want to find out. And uh, the way to do that is to ignore the benthic issues and other lower food chain issues when you're still catching fish and, and turning a blind eye to what might be happening down there. And that's some of the reasons that we're doing what we're doing in Baffin Bay with our water quality study that you probably know about, a little bit about if you read my column, and uh, it's, it certainly is an issue that, that, that probably could, every bay system could use that kind of research, because we really don't know what a, a cratering bay system looks like. Any other? Just, just make this comment. There's a couple of, th couple of things, you know, and I, and I agree with what, what the uh, panel was saying, of course, but and what you'll see in some of these bays like this is this begins to happen, and I've seen this in, in other, other things up and down the coast. As I was working this, you actually get a burst of productivity, a burst of, of, of productivity as these systems break down because nutrients and things as systems fall apart. Uh, they actually get a, a little rise in it, and it kind of gives you a false sense of some situation. But then they're not replenishing themselves. It, it always has to replenish and keep it going. And that's where we're not seeing now. It's like a big flywheel that's moving out there. You have to keep adding energy to it all the time, and we're not adding any energy to it. We're just taking away from it. And the other thing that you will notice will happen is if we get uh, as these drought and it's already as it's continues so forth. You'll see as uh, issues like nutrients and other uh, uh, constituents will, will collect in the bottom of bays, Oso Bay and other places, and you get a, 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 a quick rain, uh, just a, like a thunderstorm over Oso, and all of a sudden you'll have a fish kill because all of a sudden all this accumulated uh, debris and, and nutrients will, will, will uh, wash into the system uh, and you'll get these fish kills start to happen. So there'll be some issues like that that'll, that'll occur along. Any, anything else? On I think that's pretty good. Any, any questions about? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Johnny. Ray, you mentioned the uh, nesting that's uh, underway in the Oasis Bay. Do we have any species there where it's critical for salt land maintenance for them to be able to find fresh water? You know, I don't, I don't think I really know the answer to that, Johnny. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that, uh, as I tried to point out, that these higher salinities affect the food base for a variety of species. Um, and, and what we see is some years we see good nesting success and other years we don't. And there are, I want to be clear, there's a lot of variables that affect nesting success and fledging success. But those aren't the same either. Uh, but one of them, and probably the most important one, is food availability. Mm -hmm. And if you just don't have the bay anchovies or the other species that, that the adult birds feed to their chicks or that they feed themselves so that they can take care of their chicks, um, you know, you have these kind of collapses. And uh, it, it's hard to pin that down, John, that anybody else has looked at these other species that closely um, where the, you know, the relationship between the whooping crane and a blue crab population is, is much better understood than it is for other species that are out there. So. But what we do know is uh, in any of these situations, uh, droughts affect uh, uh, the uh, fish and wildlife just like they do us in a certain extent, and it's, it, it creates stress. And so when you're under stress, then you're more susceptible to diseases and, and these type of things. So we could start seeing more of that type of thing, and just because the stress levels on, on, these, uh, on these systems are, are 
quite high, been high and going. Although I make out the point, and I think Con, you ma made that point, is and you, and you saw it, John uh, Metz's uh, 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 rainfall over over time. This this where we are is highly variable. I mean, this this system has evolved over time. This is what it does. I mean, it understands it, and it, and, it, and the animals are adapted to it, so they they will recover. But it's a uh, uh, wh wherever we add to that stress is not good, but uh, but still, it's it's not uh, it's not what we'd like to see <laughs> for sure. Um, other questions on on just about impacts of what we're seeing. Uh, I think there was a question here that um, about how we how we can keep how we monitor uh, salinity levels in the bay, and uh, and of course uh, we saw uh, we saw that from your nude two and, <laughs> and other <laughs> other uh, deals. Con, uh, for, for, con, how in the river? What do you how do, what do you all measure up in the river or rocky either one? What you all have, you have water uh, stations or you just you sample regularly? How do you keep up with what's happening there? We have a number of stations. I'll let Rocky tell you what we monitor and how many stations we have. And uh, <coughs> yeah, throughout the basin, we, I'm going to take a rough guess, we probably have between you know, 30 or so uh, monitoring sites that we visit quarterly and take routine water quality, monitor, water quality samples. Um, and of course, most of the, uh, the basin is fresh water, and there are a few... Um, monitoring sites in the uh, tidal portion of the river that TCEQ does and collects, in addition to salinity data, um, routine data like alkalinity and nitrogen and ammonia and those types of things. Uh, and there are a number of, uh, of sites out in the bay that TCEQ also samples. But for, with respect to the, uh, the, the, pass -through, the required pass-throughs and what we monitor for the city, there's the, the salt free station that Ray showed is the monitoring site um, that's run by the Bleacher Institute. It takes uh, data every 15 minutes and that those data are used to look at the levels and as we'll probably get into a little bit more down here, but um, you know, certain things can happen with the pass through when the salinity levels are um, at certain levels, but that's the official site for um, the salinity in the bay with respect to water supply. USGS stations in the rivers. Uh, oh, the flow station. Yeah, the flow USGS station. has a number of uh, flow stations throughout the, the basin, and um, those are monitored, uh, you know, automatically. You know, I think every 15 minutes, also. And uh, again, those data are used to um, determine what actually flows into the reservoir system. That again affects how um, the agreed order is uh, operated or. It's, it's a lot of fun. You can go online. The USGS stations are all online, and you can find them by searching for them. And, um, you know, as somebody suggested, if it, if it rains on Tuesday, you know, we, we go on Wednesday and start looking at online at the gauges and start looking at the river flows, and, and you can see the, the rivers coming up and, and reaching the, the maximum flow and start tapering off rather quickly after that. And... Uh, there's just a, a tremendous amount of information out there that's publicly available, and, and all of that information is used for inflow management purposes, and reservoir capacity management purposes, and salinity levels. And it's just a lot of good mm -hmm. data out there, Larry. No, absolutely. And of course, the agencies, TCEQ and Parks and Wildlife, take take that kind of data uh, routinely as well. So they so they, they collect us. There's a lot of data that tells us what the condition is, but there's one set of uh, one piece of information that's really uh, critical that kind of brings it all together that has a direct impact on people here in Corpus Christi and our water supply and what goes to the bays and estuaries and that's the reservoir levels and John was talking about that because it's different things different kinds of ac actions happen uh, as that reservoir Choke Canyon or the combined uh, uh, levels of that those lakes reach certain levels that triggers certain actions and that's all part of what's called an, an agreed the agreed order uh, and that's one of the th topics we want to talk about now because, uh, because as we saw there, I think it, 37 uh, is where we're at now. I think you hit that, John, or 36 point. 30, 36 point. Oh, <laughs> you read, I'm sorry. 30, 36. 36. And so there's some triggers at 40 and, and, and down that, that we have to go to. So I want to make sure that people understood what that agreed order was. And so I don't know who was going to cover that or, or, or give that overview of, of what it is. But, but I can give, I give you a, a little bit of history, Con. What, uh, let you start. I could lead off. Okay. Um, I kind of cut my teeth on this one. <laughs> me too. I know. I know that one. So I was going to let somebody else start it besides me because I was there too. The city up here. That's what I want. <laughs> Where's Gus? Yeah. When we were building Choke Canyon, of course, the, the state uh, issued a water rights permit 
certificate of judic adjudication, they call it. And uh, for the first time, I believe this is true, for the first time in the state's history of issuing water rights, uh, it pr uh, inserted into the Choke Canyon permit a provision, an environmental protection provision that provided that not less than 151,000 acre feet of fresh water would be uh, released from the Choke Canyon Lake Corpus Christi Reservoir system every year uh, to flow down to Nueces Bay for uh, estuary protection purposes. Uh, and the reservoir field uh, was completed, as I recall, in about 1985, roughly. And by the way, uh, John, it was a tropical storm that actually filled Choke Canyon. It was, yeah, I remember that day or that time. Uh, despite uh, the, the uh, a lot of my directors saying it'll never fill, and, and nearly overnight, 700,000 acre feet uh, was captured by that reservoir. But I digress. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the state in 1990 uh, uh, put together an advisory uh, committee to, to recommend how the reservoir system would operate in order to provide this 151,000 acre feet of water each and every year. And that advisory committee's work resulted in an interim order that uh, established, and Larry, you may have been involved in, in establishing some More than I wanted to be. <laughs> I'm sorry? More than I wanted to be. Yeah, I, I thought you were right in the middle of that. Uh, established uh, certain uh, uh, release amounts of water that would have to be released in those days uh, during certain times of the year in certain quantities. Uh, that, that first uh, interim order was uh, then uh, amended and amended and amended again. Uh, during the course of this work, uh, the Nueces Estuary Advisory Council was established, and that is a remarkable uh, group of people who represented a wide range of stakeholders from industry to environment to municipalities to ag people to Lake Corpus Christi people, and they all sat down and they tried to uh, work together, and they succeeded in working together to come up with what we now call the agreed order. Uh, which is established by Texas Commission on Environmental Quality that, that defines how the reservoir system will be operated. And, and nowadays, uh, there are no releases uh, required under, under the 2001 or so agreed order. Uh, instead, it's all based upon how much water flows into the reservoir system as to, as to how much water is actually required to be passed through to the, to the uh, so no storage water is, uh, uh, is, is released, I should say, for environmental purposes under the existing agreed order. But th this uh, NEAC, the Nueces Estuary Advisory Council, uh, uh, was one of the very first, uh, uh, I think, success stories in having diverse interests sit down and reason together to come up with a, a solution that everybody could live with uh, in a very flashy and hot topic uh, subject. So I just wanted to tap them on the head. They, they still exist. It didn't help no, that we were doing it during a drought either. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's no. true. Uh, that, that was a very good summary. I, and just to kind of put that in context is that, that typically, you know, when we had the, when the, when we had the drought of the 50s, uh, and that's when, I, that's when I was growing up. I was born in the beginning of it. That's where I lived through it. So I, I, it's a, it burned in my mind of what it was out, out in West Texas of all places. But, uh, you know, we had a, a handful of reservoirs in the state. 40 or 50 or something like that. And basically we depended on river flow and, and, and groundwater and that type of thing. Well, after we hit the 50s and the, our population was obviously growing in Texas, everyone realized you, we couldn't continue like that. We had to come up with some other approach to deal with situations like that. And so we went into a whole era of, of reservoir, but that was our first thing, let's just build reservoirs. And so there were many, many reservoirs built, several hundred. And at a certain point in the late uh, 70s, we began to realize that if you build so many of these reservoirs and particularly the closer they are to the coast, that the freshwater inflows that come into these bays that keep them healthy and, and, and serve several purposes I'll talk about in a second, that if we begin to cut all of that off, uh, we would have consequences that we probably wouldn't want. And so we had to figure out some way to try to balance that. And it was not an easy task trying to figure out initially what to do. It was obviously not from any perspective. Because what you have to think about is not only do we need water for agriculture and municipalities and, and industry and that type of thing, 
these, these bays need it as well. And it's not just to produce uh, fish and crabs and shrimp, that's important and that type of thing, but for us it does several things. One, if we didn't have that uh, fresh water coming in uh, into those bays, when we release our discharge, our wastewater from cities, we don't release that water at a, at a tertiary level or something. We release it and, and, and plan on and expect either the rivers or the bays to complete that treatment, to be able to, to assimilate that waste and really and make use of it. So if we, the less fresh water we have, the poorer the water quality is to reach the point are we living out to basically to a giant sewage treatment plant out front of us and that brings diseases and all those type of things and so so there's this issue how do you balance all those needs and and really no one knew how to do it and it was and I, I kind of agree with that the NEAC needs tremendous credit that was the first body that really sat down and tried to figure out how to make all of this work and deserve a huge amount of credit for uh, for setting the setting the pace for moving forward not an easy task but that that's what they did and so it's a uh, it was a big step and Corpus led that way and did a, did a lot to, to make uh, to help us move the state in the way we need to go. Uh, the, uh, as a wrap up point, I would say that the NEAC is still working. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still evolution going on looking at what this water management strategy should be in terms of both protecting the water supply for municipal industrial purposes, but also for maintaining the habitat. And, and there's a whole assortment of management strategies that we're looking at, we're investigating, uh, can continue to be researched and more data is being developed uh, out there real time and, and so we, you know we don't think that this current agreed order is the final agreed order you know it's an evolution as we find opportunities for improvement uh, for all the users you know I look for those changes to be implemented through a revision to the agreed order and uh, so I, I just think you know we're now where the easy steps have been made. The next ones are going to be incremental improvements, not yeah. big improvements. So, so and, and I think it's a good summary, Ray. I appreciate it. So, what does this actually mean now? And I, but I might get you to follow this. I do have. I, I looked up a copy of the agreed order. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's still the one that's current. And we were talking about uh, because what happens is as that lake, those lake reservoir uh, levels drop to certain levels, it triggers certain ac actions within the city, uh, and things that we have to do. And that was part of the agreed order that. Yeah, if we're not going to release water in the estuary, we have to do everything we can to save water from here, uh, this type of thing. So it, it has certain things. Now, what I see in this right up, I'll, tell me if I'm wrong in this, uh, if it's updated. And this was part of it, what this trigger says, any month when reservoir system storage is less than 40%, but equal to or greater than 30%, you were showing that on your graph, of total system storage, the city of Corpus Christi shall implement day, uh, uh, time of day outdoor watering restrictions and shall reduce target inflows uh, to Nueces Bay by 1,200 acre feet and those type of things. So that, is that, I'm, I'm assuming that's still accurate. I mean, that hasn't changed. And it gets more severe as we move to that 20 level. John, you are, you are the model. So there's, there's real steps in here. Yes. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. If you um, are not releasing water into the bays and estuaries, once we receive rain, then do we play catch up kind of? Do we release more water? Unless it's changed. I mean, yeah, let me address that and then go right. Ray follow what we're okay. doing. Uh, the way that the, uh, the agreed order to work with the pass-throughs is what comes into the reservoir system in, in a given month up to a certain target has to be passed through. So if it doesn't reach that target amount, there's nothing owed. Um, but like Ray said, we are working on, on ways to better manage the water. And we you know, know that probably a little bit of water every once in a while is not as be be beneficial as you know, maybe holding back a little bit and then letting it go. It. So we've been working with that, and I'll let Ray expand. Yeah, on we that we have a concept that we're looking at through the uh, Noises Estuary Advisory Council process of of uh, banking water. It's a little bit trickier. It's uh, you know, that's kind of what I was score talking about. Score cap score is still kept on a monthly basis. You know, if it came in, if it was a pass through requirement for this month, the decision is deliver it to the bay or hold it back. Because in some months, there might be a, a, a very modest or small amount of water that would be passed through to the bay, not enough to really affect, uh, have significant effect in the bay. Instead of just letting it dribble out, maybe you save up two or three months worth to, to you have an opportunity to, to put enough in to make a difference. Right. You know, a thousand acre feet in the bay doesn't even show up at the meter. Because these systems, and Nueces is, is, is a good example, 
work in a couple of ways. Yes, you need water coming in on some regular basis. That, that one, one thing that that does, it does create basically a, a natural fish hatchery at the upper end of, a, of an oasis where you keep the salinity down so, so some animals so organisms survive so that when we get back to normal that it more quickly repopulates, that helps. But these systems also are really designed, uh, in our flashy systems as we call them, is they do need uh, floods. We, we have spring and fall floods, so there are times when it's better to hold and release a large amount. So it's, it's not so that, that fact, type of thing. In fact, we are saying there are places uh, like in the Nueces River Delta itself down the old Rincon Bayou where even small amounts of water, modest amounts of inflows can make a big difference to the environment and pertain that, retain that little vestige of a mm -hmm. good quality habitat for organisms. And Rincon is a great region. example. That's exactly that's right. So there's kind of a management strategy focused on the delta and the Rincon Bayou, as opposed to the bigger part of the Oasis Bay, which we're kind of looking at as you know, one hand, left hand kind of deal, and trying to figure that out. Now, with the banking concept, this is all real preliminary. There are provisions in the agreed order that allow for us, for the NEAC, to look at some adaptive management strategies. And so I think we've probably taken that language as broadly as we can. And as long as nobody complains too loudly to TCEQ, that we can continue to look for these uh, strategies and try to test them out to s see if they make sense for both the environment and the water supply. Uh, so it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Question. Is that one of the strategies that you guys make it more productive that, that type where you've got Bayou pipeline identified? Well, this is, uh, yeah, exactly right. The Rincon Bayou or, or that part of the Nueces Delta complex, those real shallow marshes, all those great uh, wetlands out there, uh, you know, they just fill up with uh, larval juvenile fish and, and even bigger fish. And so it's a real sensitive habitat. So if you can put even a little bit of water out there once in a while, it really makes a difference. But even uh, now where we're under this 40% mark, you know, there are, there are no releases being made. But that pipeline was but done yeah. one of those so projects to make it more productive. And while we, right. While the NEAC came up with the strategy, uh, the city of Corpus Christi actually built a pipeline to be able to deliver water into the Rincon Bayou. That's part of their, that was part of the deal for the last agreed order that was incorporated in there. But, and it works, right? It works, it works very nicely when you have water mm -hmm. to deliver. And yeah. that for those, there is a pump station there um, upstream of the saltwater barrier dam that when there are, there are required pass-throughs and it may not be a large amount and they'll want to get it into the delta, they'll turn on those pumps and it'll bypass the river and actually go into the upper portion of the delta where it will do some good. Yeah. It's a small area, so it only does, it does a lot of real good, but only in a very small area. That's important to keep mm -hmm. in mind here. And Dave's got it, Dave. Um, Ray or, or Rocky, would you address how uh, the, the concept of uh, evaporation plays into this, uh, this banking, the water banking? Uh, as a water planning. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, we, we, uh, the estuary program in the city of Corpus Christi work you know, hand in hand. But, um, anytime there's one, the estuary program wants anything banked or, or passed through, um, you know, th they work with the city. And uh, there is the question of, you know, wh whose water is evaporating? Uh, <laughs> so um, it, it's, it it's being worked on, yeah. I'll put it that way. Yeah, we're just in the early stages, but it's a critically important factor. You, you know, we're looking, you can't hold water for a couple of years because you know, there's constant evaporation out there. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's a, it becomes a challenge of what can you afford to hold back and how long can you hold it? And, yeah. and, and I should say, there are certain times of the year that are perhaps even more important to get water into the bay than other times. And, and, and so you know you kind of you kind of look at those spring fish spawning seasons mm -hmm. and those other things and when the shrimp are moving in and you want to get the conditions right and have the biological productivity there it's a little bit of a uh, it's it's some real world hands-on management that you don't see in very many other systems anywhere else so in the other part with this evaporation if you know you say well okay some of the path the banked water has evaporated well, then the, the terms of the agreed order are not being met. And we don't want to do anything that's going to get the city in trouble with the TCQ by not following the agreed order. So we're working, you know, I'd say we're working with the, the, the estuary program and the city are working together. TCEQ is also very involved with the, these decisions that are made. 
So that is, is this adaptive management, but that will have to be addressed if you know we go to an official banking system and how it all works. Put it in a closed container. <laughs> <laughs> in an aqua. <laughs> And, and I think that brings up, you know, one of the things you see during droughts and we're seeing here is that, you know, people don't really, we all, I'm part of that too, I live here in town, uh, don't really appreciate water. I mean, we all think we turn on the hydrant and water comes out and, and, and that's, that's what it will always will. And, and uh, so when you get into a real drought situation where water becomes really valuable, you begin to think of, of, uh, of how, to, how you should save it. And some, it may not help you immediately, but it could help you in the long term. And there are other things we ought to be thinking about. I mean, really, obviously, water conservation. That's always, that, that's the easiest one to think, but we're gonna talk about some of those in, in, uh, impacts in a second. But uh, how you use your wastewater discharges coming out. See, because we, uh, water comes out of our wastewater plants we, we, where it goes, because frankly, fish and wildlife to a certain extent don't really care about it, it's just water, and they can, and they can use that nutrient if they're healthy, so how do, you, how do you make a best use of that type of thing? In many cities, I don't know Corpus' situation, we may know the answer, but uh, leaky pipelines and pipes of old infrastructure they can lose from 15 to 30 percent of your water disappears in the ground because I don't know what of course I'm sure you all look at that in the city but that's that's another issue so there's there's things like that that obviously we're going to start doing and need to be doing obviously here and I will I want to give a, a kudo to this there are several places around uh, the state and believe me, I, I studied this for years that really have taken it seriously and moving forward on, on water conservation and taking care of water one is El Paso another is San Antonio and the other is Corpus Christi historically uh, particularly, I know I used to use, uh, when I would give talks on water, I, I used Corpus Christi in business and in the industry, how they, how they use water here uh, has, has kind of led the way in some of the things. So we they haven't been quiet here, and I think Corpus has led in many areas as, as, as these other cities, where some other cities, nameless ones, Dallas, have not done that type of thing. <laughs> uh, and really, for, you know, our, our per capita water use here is 137 uh, gallons per day or something like that or 100, and that, in, in Dallas, they use 200, or some number like that. So it's a, there's challenges all around, so I didn't make it that little kick. Any, any other kind of long-term comment? I just had one comment oh. on uh, evaporation. You know, it's a function of surface area, temperature, and humidity, and, and so with a drought situation like we're in, and the global climate change is having a small, you know, impact on our temperatures locally, so we're seeing just kind of that steady climb, and so, mm -hmm. In addition to the long range forecast showing below normal rainfall, they're showing above normal temperatures. And so that's not good as far as evaporation is concerned. Exactly. Con, did you have uh, what, uh, this? Well, I have a question about evaporation because it, it came up back in 87, 88. So because the comment comes, well, it's going to evaporate anyway, so why don't we just use the water? But doesn't evaporation sort of work like a blanket? I mean, once the conditions are there, it will evaporate that much. But that to evaporate any given day. And so I, you know, I hear folks talking about, well, what the heck, we'll use it up. But it just cause the water to have gone faster. Um, there's no benefit to using the water that's going to evaporate tomorrow, today, because it's still going to evaporate, right? And Joe McComb was a guy. He used to serve as counsel, and he would always say, all right. So maybe you could help explain how this evaporation works as a function of the available water and, and, and helping the solution to that with the dry trail. Well, the more surface area you have for volume, the more evaporation you have by percentage. So if you keep a full reservoir, I guess, you know, the evaporation percentage of the water capacity that you have is less. I mean, and someone who says, I'm just going to use that water anyway because it's yeah. going to evaporate tomorrow, that's not... That sounds like Joe. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't... They're matter. still going to evaporate <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, they're still going to be cool. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to figure out how that, that, that formula works, but so the evaporation is a given and will happen given those conditions at whatever rate. Mm -hmm. So just to say we'll use tomorrow's evaporation today <laughs> only adversely impacts the supply. Well, the surface time. is still there. The surface of what reservoir is still there. It's, it, no matter how fast you use it, it's still evaporating at that rate. It's going to go anyway. I think you had a question. What part of the surface water evaporation doesn't stay in the blanket of humidity. And we have all these prevailing winds mm. that are constantly removing that water, and then more evaporation takes place. You know, we had no wind. Wind dry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the issue of evaporation is very important from a reservoir management perspective. And we might get Rocky to talk about, you know, differential rates between Choke Canyon Reservoir and Lake Corpus Christi and, and how that affects the city's management plan. Well, tell them on that, I think. There's a, the, the way the city operates the reservoirs right now is Choke Canyon being a deeper, cooler reservoir 
percentage-wise, evaporates less water than Lake Corpus Christi. Um, so the, to maximize the yield of the system, uh, the city has operated the reservoirs and draw down Lake Corpus Christi first. Use it, well, actually uses uh, Mary Rose water first, basically, and then uh, supplements from Lake Corpus Christi. And uh, we are at the point, this is I think the first time it's ever happened, the operating plan calls for Lake Corpus Christi to be drawn down to about 77 feet, which is about 15% of its capacity. And um, at that time, if, if it goes too much lower than that, the city of Alice and the city of Beeville will have problems with their intake system. So now the city is, pass, is releasing water from Choke Canyon Reservoir to keep Lake Corpus Christi at about 77 feet. And that'll continue until uh, Choke Canyon goes down, um, I, I forget the exact number, but if it get, if, I think if it hit, reaches 155 feet, which is, um, it's full at 220 and a half feet, um, then they'll start just releasing water from Choke to, pat, to flow through Lake Corpus Christi just to, to supply water. Hopefully we don't get there. Uh, but it, like I said, it's to maximize the yield of the system, which means that during the historic drought of records, we know we will have enough water in the reservoir system, you know, historically, you know, based on hyd hy um, hydrologic history, that the lakes will fill again. And um, the city operates under what's called a safe yield system, which means if this current drought is worse than the drought of record that the plan is uh, based on, if we get to that point, we still have six months of, of water in the reservoirs. So that's why the, they've let Lake Corpus Christi go down as low as it is because Choke Canyon is a better storage system for the water supply. Essentially what she said is it would be foolish and irresponsible to fill up Lake Corpus Christi because the water is wasted so quickly because it's got a, so much surface area, it's such a shallow lake, it would evaporate, and it really would be irresponsible. Yes, John, Con just question. made a good point. What I'm sorry, Con? Say that. Well, uh, Lake Corpus Christi has a much larger watershed uh, and it can yes. fill up much more quickly when it does rain than Choke Canyon does. Which is true, good point. John, question? You lose that capacity. Right. Where it'd be wasted. <laughs> that was Con Mims, by the way. Con Mims, M I M F S, -S <laughs> made that statement, not me. It's a question over in the corner or a comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, Rick. Why do we not include uh, levels of Lake Texana? Uh, because that's where the Mary Road starts. Well, what the agreed is order is specific to yeah. the Choke Canyon Lake Corpus Christi system. So it, the, the combined volume is what causes those triggers for the, the pass-throughs. It, it has to do with water permits because the permits are for, uh, for Choke Canyon and, and oh, that agreed order. Up there, yeah, <laughs> and, the, uh, uh, and, and the uh, Mary Road is purchased water. But. Yeah. Why don't you come up here so you can see, yeah. I give him my and mic, talk, yes. New York. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gus Gonzalez, Director of, of Water Operations for City Corpus Christi. We get 41,840 acre feet contract take or pay from Lake Texana. If the lake level is above 43, the pool elevation is 44. If it's above 43, they give us another 12,000 interruptible water. Uh, generally, because they get more rain, those la that lake has been full, and we always take that amount. Uh, beyond the 50, we don't get any more. I mean, that's it. And so we use that water first. Now, I will say in the new DCP drought contingency plan, uh, we're going to modify that just a little bit to say if they should, in fact, drop down to their stage one, that would trigger a stage one for us if that should happen. But normally it's not in the agreed order for Lake Texana. Uh, and, and it's all contract water, and once we use that water up, and it takes me all year to get it, but because of pumpage, so uh, we, we take it every year, and so it doesn't really affect us in that regard. Got the direct answer, which is good. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, we've been talking about a, a bit and uh, already kind of got into it, and, and we're our kind of final wrap-up topic here, along with improving the situation, we'd like to talk about in, in the end is the human impacts. We've been discussing that, and we want to talk for a second about how is the drought affecting sport fishing industry, or commercial fishing, city operations, and that type of thing. How, how, what are those effects? We already hear some that we're going to have to be dealing with here in the city. When I used, when I gave talks, a lot of talks on water issues around the state years ago, I nearly always started off with. But we talk about having twice as many Texans here in, in another 30 years, which should scare a lot of people. Uh, that we but they said, you know, how are we going to meet the water supply needs? How are we going to, to meet that? We, it would be very difficult. And my answer was always, we, never, we don't really have a water shortage as far as people. We can meet for the, when you look at the population projections and the water we have, we can take care of the water needs for people through the projected 50-year window. It's the lawns, people's lawns that we can't take care of. We can't deal with that. That's the issue that we can't deal with. They can't take care of that part of it. And so that's the question. How, what are all these, what are we going to be seeing? So uh, we've talked a little bit about it, but just open to the panel to any, any observations on what are, what are we seeing and we'll see. I got rocks in my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. That's and I got rain catches under every spout, but that doesn't matter what it does. <laughs> <laughs> they look pretty good, though. Well, I, I would like, I mean, and maybe Gus or Brent want to speak to this. Um, they are working on changing the, um, it's not just a, where you can't water during the certain time of the day, only when the lakes are low. The city is actually looking at revising the water conservation plan to be a year-round plan. And it, um, it, I'm, kudos to them for doing it. I, so if you yeah. want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, As Rocky mentioned, we're working on revising, actually almost finished revising the water conservation and drought contingency, contingency plan. Uh, separating it into two different documents, water conservations, year-round best management practices to um, improve efficiency, change habits, reduce water waste, just things we should be doing regularly. And then drought contingency, which is short-term, uh, painful measures that are, they're, they're going to hurt, but we, we have to do them in, in order to maintain that supply until another rainy season. Um, and what we're going to do is is next month we're going to have another public forum similar to this and present the all the changes of that revised plan and we're also going to be distributing and you know, have online the draft of, of the conservation plan uh, so people can review it and at that meeting uh, you can come and give your comments you can you can heckle me about it all, all you want um, and we'll we'll take all the feedback and, and edit it back into the plan and hopefully present it to council at the end of April or, or May time frame. Um, but like, like Rocky said, some of the changes have to do with uh, not watering between 10 and 6 year round, uh, not re, uh, having water waste. Uh, right now the provision is you can't let water run down the, into the streets and, and storm drains only during a drought. Well, that should be a year round thing. Um, and in addition, we're looking at turf grasses. Uh, in San Antonio, they, they decided after doing a research project with Texas A&M, uh, this is a list of turf grasses you can plant in the city. If it can't go through a, a, a period of 60 days without water and, and survive, then you can't plant it. So those are the things we're going to be looking at, and that's more of a that's going to take a little bit longer looking at some of our, our development unified development codes, building codes, and seeing what we can update and change uh, to improve just uh, the, the way that we're installing buildings, the way that we're we're doing landscapes and that sort of thing. So. The date is uh, tentatively April 17th, so keep an eye out for that program. Larry, Larry if I could uh, touch on uh, recreational fishing, and, and David, you could straighten me out when I wander off the, the path here. There was a time not too long ago when uh, recreational fishing at, at Choke Canyon Reservoir and Lake Corpus Christi were big economic drivers up in those communities, and, and they still can be. But as David said, you know, you can't get boats in the water, and if you can, there's too many obstacles out there now to safely navigate. And, and so uh, I've heard reports that they're not having the kind of bass tournaments they used to have in these lakes uh, uh, with the ramps closed. Now, I could tell you, I, I tried to book a hotel room to go do a little bird watching up there, and <coughs> There must be like three oil field workers in every hotel room there is up there, so. They have, a different, trouble, they have a different economic balance yeah, going on there. Yeah, now. they're not having trouble filling the hotel rooms up there, I'll tell you that. 
Uh, but those little bait camps and the RV parks and all those businesses that depend upon the recreational fishermen, the tournament fishermen, and those folks are hurting, and I, I do feel very badly for them. But, and it, but it is a drought, and it's the nature of the beast. And, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. David, I don't know what you've seen up there. Well, I, the you know, Joe, Joe Canyon never really had a, a big uh, um, uh, bass tournament uh, business. They were on a few, but they really don't have enough uh, hotel rooms to support the kind of big bass tournaments that some of the other lakes have. Um, and, and the fishing over there is good. Um, I think Lake Corpus Christi is the real sad uh, situation. Um, you can't, I wouldn't be a real estate agent over there either right now. I'm still trying to sell lakefront <laughs> property. Uh, but unfortunately, since I brought up real estate, a lot of those people probably got sold a bill of goods in the first place. They bought their lots when, when, they were, when the lake was full and, and no one really told them what might happen. Um, and, and that put a real sour taste in their mouth. And I, I get an earful from a lot of people from Mathis because of my philosophy on one water and freshwater inflows and things like that. But um, I don't know, it, you know, you try not to make this about bass and shrimp or big city and little city and all that. And, um, the habitat over there was created by the reservoir. So to compare that to a natural natural estuary system is simply not valid. Um, I, I can certainly make the argument, but once the emotional part gets in, you lose your argument, you know, to those folks who bought property over there and can't launch their boats. It's tough. I feel sorry for them, too. From a fishing perspective on, on coastal waters, it actually will probably not have that much of an effect. It, in fact, it, with the clear water and those types of things, there's probably some some uh, benefit, perceived benefit. What happens in that and also on the shrimp side, it's not immediate. It's because you have several year classes. We've had some very good year classes of fish come along and so they kind of support that population. It'll be some years after the drought because of what's happening now because of they won't be producing as that one. So we won't see, uh, we'll see that loss of year class and we'll see uh, happening a few years down the road. That's typical of what happens to from that side of things, so we'll, we'll see well, that. It kills off those invasive uh, plants, too, sometimes. Yeah. When, when, does the water, when there's no water, it can't grow. So there you go, so, you there know, go. Salvinia yeah. and stuff like that dies. Yeah, it does help. There is some. And there are some, I guess, and that's really why, instead of ending on a down, and as I look at my question, we want to talk about what we can do and saying what we are doing. I think there's some, which I would appreciate. You know, is, is we always have that saying is that in this country and state and maybe locally, we, we really manage and govern by crisis. It's when it happens, we actually yeah. take stuff. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And, and so, the, what, what, and you, you, you heard from Brett, which I think is pretty, these are the types of things we, we can think about now because it's really hitting us and will that, that we have some real water issues here and we uh, anticipate the system coming back. We hope that it will do that, but we don't want to be in a position the next time or whoever's here from now to, to have that. So taking the steps to conserve water, deal with these issues is something we need to do every day. So there are, I appreciate what the city's doing at, at, at putting the, uh, moving forward on this thing, we've, we've got to do those types of things. So any, uh, let's talk about other things that we're doing. We got to, we do have, we're all in this together, fish and wildlife and people. And so we've got to figure out how to make this work uh, uh, then get through it uh, and try to minimize the, the potential for it next time. You can't do anything about another, Mother Nature, but you can prepare and we need to prepare. So I don't know if anyone else had any kind of wrap up time statements on that, please. Well, uh, let me take you down a notch or two further before we. Okay. Yeah, no, go ahead. And, and, I know, Connie, you're going to do that. You're not going to let me get out here with uh, this. Depress us further. Uh, you know, about three legislative sessions ago, the Senate Bill 3 was passed, and mm -hmm. that required uh, uh, what, what are called environmental flow regimes to be established for uh, the, the, the rivers and streams of the state and the freshwater inflows for the bay and estuary systems mm -hmm. of the state. And uh, there were seven uh, river basins and bay areas uh, designated, Noasis and Corpus Christi and Baffin Bay was one of them. Uh, in, uh, in the course of this work, uh, uh, there were, there were two, two groups established for each of these basin and bay areas. One was an expert science team and the other uh, was a stakeholder group. And the expert science team was to look at the basin and the bays and determine what kind of flows are necessary uh, to maintain a sound ecological environment. Uh, and then the, uh, without regard to any effects on humans, human or industrial needs, just strictly mm -hmm. environmental. The stakeholder group was to take the scientists' work 
and, and add the, the human layer on top of that and send up a recommendation to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality of what flow regimes uh, the state should in, 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 install like, uh, in future per water right permits. In other words, a new water right permit would have to adhere to these specific environmental flow requirements that come out of this, this, this work. My, my point is, and, and, and this is the low notch, is that there was, there was only one in, environmental area in the entire state that was found by the scientists to be uh, unecologically sound, and that was the Nueces Bay and, and Delta. And, uh, uh, but the, what, the, the good thing that's come out of all of this, once again, is uh, that uh, a wide variety of stakeholders from the coastal bend all the way up to Rock Springs throughout this river basin and bay area came together to come up with flow recommendations that we could all agree with and, but more importantly, to come up with a work plan that we would implement over a period of time to improve the situation. And that work plan has 30 or 40 different action items, but the top eight uh, are, are our number one priorities to pursue, and six of those have to do with improvements to the bays uh, here in Delta. And one of those, and I think the number one uh, action item is has something to do with this banking concept and, and what, what Ray calls smart uh, water management. So this is the upside. Yeah. Okay, good. I wanted, to, I wanted to wrap up on something good, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> trying to move us toward that. Yeah. It, it was a struggle. It did. We no, we, no, you did good. You did well, good with it, and that's a plus. We're wrapping up because I have some other. Uh, now we are. We're wrapping up. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead anyway. Here. Okay. <laughs> Brent showed a slide earlier that showed water usage for our area last year of 125,000 acre feet. Right. That's how much water was used out of the reservoirs and the Mary Road system. The combined capacity that the, that the people who own the water think they can get out of is close to 205,000 acre feet, right? There's another 85, 90,000 acre feet that is supposed to be available for municipal and industrial purposes. If you can, I'm very concerned when it, because now with the Eagleford Shell and all the economic development going on, a lot of industries coming in, you know, as we start using all of that, and you start overlaying these droughts on top of that, I, I'm not sure where that number is. And, and so if you can imagine if for the last couple of years we'd have been using another 50 or 60 or 80,000 acre feet of water a year out of the system. You know, those lake levels today you know, would look good <laughs> to where they would be if we were fully usable, utilizing that water. That's why Gus has the toughest job around trying to make sure we have enough water not just for the people who are here, but for continued growth and development. And good luck with that, Gus. <laughs> okay. I have a quick question. How much does the added linear fee, how much does the Lake Tex, to, how much does the addition to Lake Texana, how much water are we going to get from that addition? Sorry. Uh, 35,000 acre feet is what's permitted. And if I can okay. take about three and, minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Lake Texana gives us 41,800 acre feet, and then I got another 12,000 if the lake level is at above 43 at the beginning of the year. So that's but about. Then once we add, we do more construction. And then you add another 35,000 35, from the Colorado from River. The Colorado River. The Colorado, yeah. Sorry, yeah. The Colorado River. Okay. And so if I could just make some comments, um, we have a Corpus Christi Bay. Yes. Well, we have 35,000 acre, we're second priority. Okay. Um, and so from 1901, so we're, we're working with LCRA to even do a small off channel reservoir to ensure we have and get our 35,000 acre because they've got to give some to the rice farmer. So we're working with them. Um, and, and so we're doing that. Um, I, I will say, let me just, just say, say a few comments. 
we have a well diversified system. I mean, we, we're bringing water from other basins like Texana, the two lakes. Uh, so, so in that regard, uh, we're doing well. Um, going forward, we're, we're in the design 50% of Mary Roads Phase 2, which will add 35,000. You're right. There, there's very little water in the Colorado. Now, it, we may start that process, and I've, as I've told the city manager and council, this fall will be the f defining moment because I've got to start uh, uh, ordering pumps and in order to meet a two weeks a two year schedule uh, for spring of 2015 to bring that water online and if you remember the the minimum rainfall uh, as we go out so so we're doing that um, we're also working on the initiative for desalinization I mean M&G has come to town said they want to help us and if there's an opportunity there I think whether we they do or we do I think we're going to go with and try to do a demonstration pilot project of, of some sort of groundwater saltwater desalinization we've been talking to the state the bureau Texas Water Development Board um, uh, industry is 40 percent. We're in a perfect storm. We've got this drought running against the Eagle Ford Shell. I think the Eagle Ford Shell is going to change this landscape. We've got a lot of industrial people coming on the San Pat side. Uh, our strategy should be to continually add water to the system every five to ten years, period. I mean, I think that rather than waiting for a drought, we need to do the science and feasibility to continue to add. And we're trying to minimize the impact of the rate pairs. Uh, of the Garwood, we're looking at LNRA has come back to us and asked if if they'd be we would be willing to lease 10,000 acre feet of that. If that happens, that would be a cost share to them. That that would minimize our rate impacts, and they would help us in essentially build the pipeline or at least a third. Um, so we're doing that. I've had a lot of people knock on my door, ask, you know, hey, I can build a desal plant. Just give me the green light and the money. We'll do it. Um, we meet with the port industries. They're a big stakeholder group. They take 40 percent, uh, and so it, it takes a, a lot of effort on a lot of people's part. We, ha we have a, lot, a large customer base, uh, a large customer class with all the little cities that are take water, Alice, Beeville, Robstown. Water goes all the way to Rockport, down to Kingsville. Um, the mayor has established a Blue, Blue Ribbon Water Task Force Committee. Uh, Dr. Ferguson's going to be leading that charge of five people, and we're going to share not only looking at policies, but also some of the strategies coming out of the region in and, and what's our next water pro uh, strategy after Mary Road. So a lot of things are happening by this summer. I think you'll see some things coming back to council. Uh, we're certainly keeping council aware, uh, either an open session or an executive session about some of the things that are going on. So. Well, let me tell you, San Diego has just, Poseidon is starting construction. Matter of fact, Kiwit is their contractor. They started the program 12 years ago. Uh, their water is about $6 a thousand. They co-located with a co-generation plant. Uh, it's going to be a 50 million gallon plant a, a day, 50 million gallon a, a, a day plant. Uh, their, 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 their cost is about $6 a thousand. Ours is about, for residential, is about $5 a thousand. Uh, right now, industrials are paying 250, and then they pay another dollar to get take out the chemicals we put into it. So, so that's that's kind of where it's at. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, has uh, the city of Corpus Christi uh, considered selling uh, water for fracking? Uh, matter of fact, we've been approached to doing that. There's two two things that have disallowed us to do that. One is we, our permits don't allow for mining out of Choke Canyon or Lake Orvis Christi, and two is uh, certainly we'd have to go back to council and, uh, and get a contract for a ward to do that. They've asked for 1,000 acre feet over 10 years, which is, is, is a minor amount. I mean, 1,000 acre feet uh, certainly would put money in the bank and revenues to offset some of these other costs, but no, we're not doing it at this point. I'm afraid that their, their wells are getting so close to the choke that they may be drawing water under the influence of surface water. That's my problem. Okay. Well, first, I do want to make one point. I think you had mentioned that um, over the course since the last drought, our major industries in Corpus Christi, the refinery folks and those guys, they've actually reduced their use. Oh, of absolutely. Water. They've done they've the, the they they've done a great job because they know that water is a is a big component of their their cost, and so they're recycling water is eight times at least eight or nine times in their refineries. Uh, if 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 industry is forty percent of our take on this side, it's probably seventy percent on the sand pet. To side Don, something like that maybe? Currently it's about even split. Oh, 50-50. Well, we, yeah. well, well, we got Chenier coming in at $10 billion plan. We've got, uh, now that uh, Hot Iron has, has announced, uh, we got the steel Chinese plant, and then you got all the offshoots. So 
you're seeing a, a significant growth. Now, we may pull the trigger on Mary Roads Phase 2 this fall, and it may rain shortly thereafter. But, but that, again, goes back to our strategy about adding water every five to ten years. Yes, we did that. Um, we we um, we looked at that under the Region N Water Coastal Bend Water Planning Group. Uh, they did. Uh, they use HDR as their consultant for that group. We looked at dredging Lake Corpus Christi. It's it's on the order of about. I think it was about. If if Mary Roads is seven hundred fifty dollars an acre foot amortized, salt water maybe about seventeen hundred dollars per acre foot amortized over thirty years. Sedimentation removal from Lake Corpus Christi was in the order of about 3000 It's just so expensive to remove the material, stockpile it, move it out of there, handling all that solids of a lake that, that size. So it, we, we've looked at it. It's just not cost competitive. Can I just say the lakes are so rarely full that there's almost always storage capacity available in the reservoirs. So it isn't like water flowing in and overflowing and coming to the bay. It just doesn't happen very often. The bucket is almost always available to catch water. Te Te Texas Water Development Board owes us a, a bathymetric survey. We contracted them last spring. Uh, and I don't think there's a lot of sediment has come into that lake. I mean, uh, some of the divers have gone down, some of these intake structures for the city of Alice. They're seeing very little sediment down there. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what they find. Good. Thank you, sir. Well, my glass half empty panel, I don't know how to. <laughs> If, if they have anything on a half full side, I think we, we wrapped it up. But if there's no other questions, I, I do appreciate I want to uh, I'll give a round of applause to our panel, which I appreciate. Some very important issues, and I uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're we're going to be dealing with this for a long time in the future, but uh, I think we had a, a good session today. I learned a lot myself, so thank you all for being here and, and participating. So have a good day and safe drive home.